And he's like, you've been paid every year since 2002 to drive race cars. I said, yeah. He's like, that's amazing. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> and I, like it, it, it got to the point where like, at first I've never, I didn't think about it. I was like, yeah, that's what I've done my whole life. But I've been fortunate enough every year I've raced cars and I've been paid, you know, some years better than others, but I've been paid and that's all I've ever done for a living. So it's, I always tell people I have the best life in the world. And it's also why I'm miserable every day. It's the Kenny Wallace Conversation brought to you by Jex. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation brought to you by Jex, the leader in high performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jegs.com for everything you need. I always take a breath every time I do one of these because it seems like we just keep one up in ourselves. Um, he won it all two weeks ago in NASCAR. Please welcome A.J. Allmendinger. Hello, A.J. Well, Kenny, it was just the the inspiration of seeing you doing doing an interview interview with you on stage before the race. I mean, that that's all I needed. Well, you know what was funny uh, is when you won the race, I thought to myself, you know, when we had A.J. on Trackside Live, I said, it won't be an upset if he, if he wins. And uh, before we get started... Uh, you know, Kenny conversation, we, we go everywhere, but congratulations on that new baby named Daryl. And I saw on Instagram that you wrapped that baby in that checkered flag that you won at the Roval. Yeah. So, you know, usually I give the checkered flag away. It's always cool to give it to, uh, especially to a, a kid in the grandstands. And I had to laugh. I kept that one and I walked up into the grandstands and Chris, C. Rice followed me behind with the checker flag, and he was like, give that thing away. And I went to hand it to somebody, and then I was like, no, I need that back. Give me that back. I was like, so it, I almost gave it away. Fortunately, the, the person I gave it to was uh, my spotter, Frank Denny. It was his wife and uh, their daughter, so I, I owe them a checker flag, but I definitely had to steal it back for, uh, for Arrow. So we have it, wrapped him up in it, and a uh, cool memory for sure. Man, that was a close call. I, you know, I I think that we all – I heard a great story about um, Bjorn Borg, the, the tennis player, where he was bitter in his life, and he gave away all his Wimbledon trophies. And years later, he said he spent a million dollars buying all his trophies back. So because I know of that story, that was a good save, AJ. Uh, man, that baby, you're, what a story, Uh being able to grab that checker flag back and have it for arrow. Yeah. I, you know, it's, that's one of those things that, uh, it, it, so I always laugh. Well, I tell this story. Now. Yeah. I tell this story, you know, back in the day. So when I did, when I did the, the Indy 500 for Roger Penske and, and team Penske, uh, the next week, that was a great memory. Almost won the race. Seatbelts come undone, all that. But the next weekend was probably one of the worst racing weekends I've ever had in my life. I crashed twice at Detroit uh, in two laps. Crashed on the first day in the first race on uh, like three laps or three corners into the race. And then the next day after that, uh, crashed the first corner in the race. So my engineer, Ron, at the time, I remember sitting there head down like, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. And he says, uh, it's just all stories, AJ. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Ron? He's like, think about it, man. At the end of the day, you know, when we get old, what do we have? We just have our stories and our memories. He's like, last week, pretty good memory. He's like, right now in Detroit, not a great memory, but it's still a story. I was like, shut up, Ron. I was like, it makes sense. I got it, but not at this moment. So with that said, you know, it's a it's a great story that Arrow can be able to tell as he gets older that, you know, basically a month after he was born, I won him a checkered flag. You know, uh, now that I'm 60, I've, I've, been, I've been saying this a lot. Uh, people say, Wallace, you have so many stories. I said, when you get to be 60, you just have, you, you tell the truth and, and people call them stories. Uh, along those same lines, uh, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, him and Joe Perry, the, the lead guitarist, they got to arguing and uh, Steven Tyler told Joe Perry, it's part of the journey, man. And, and some people get that and some people don't, but along those lines, um, I have a lot to get to and I, I, because I listen to you, I want to respond to that. You've been on one hell of a journey, um, and we're going to get to it. But, and I know this is a cliche, but you are like wine. 
to me, you're driving better than you ever have. Your life is on track. So awesome. Your marriage, you have a baby. Do you think right now you're better than you've ever been? Uh, yeah, it, especially in my NASCAR side of it, definitely. It, yeah, uh, you know, it's just as you said, it is is I spent my first so many years, my my first three, four, five years, really, and and it, even even now, I, I still think of it this way. But I was just trying to survive, right? Mm. Like, you know, I came from open wheel racing. I I got into NASCAR. I never even drove a stock car. I'd run three truck races, and they put me in Cup uh, at maybe at least a time of that had the most competitive fulfilled series. Right. Kenny, you were part of that, you know, yeah. in the 78 car, like yeah. just trying to qualify for the race with, with the team. Was, it felt like you won. I, I remember <laughs> qualifying last at Bristol and making the race. And it was, I was like, this is the happiest moment of my life. I just qualified last, but I'm in the race. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and you know, like just kind of, just kind of as I got my feet under me at Red Bull, you know, they let me go for Scott speed. And then it's like, I spent, the next year at at Petty, given all my prize money back and any money I made just to keep racing. So it was like, it didn't feel like until about the fourth or fifth year that I'd actually even understood even to how to drive a stock car, let alone race it. So, uh, you know, just everything that I've kind of journeyed through in NASCAR, uh, I definitely feel like now that it, I'm the best that I've ever been and on, on all aspects, not just on ovals, but even on road courses. So, you know, and, and what allows that is, is Matt calling Chris Rice. They let my personality just be me. They know I'm, I'm crazy. Like I'm crazy, right? Like you hear me on the radio. You're crazy good. You're yeah. crazy good. Well, you hear me on the radio, man, the emotions, it's like a roller coaster, but they know I'm giving everything I have every lap. So, uh, but definitely I, I, that's why at 41 years old, I don't feel like uh, I'm anywhere close to stopping because I just feel like every time I get on the racetrack, I am getting better. Yeah. I want to make you feel better. You know, there's a reason we call this conversation. So uh, I was driving for Robbie Benton and I had brought him like $1.2 million. That's all I could muster up. And uh, I'm brutally honest in a good way, though. I'm going to make you feel better. So I give him 1.2. That's all I got. I know it costs whatever, you know, five, six. We get three quarters away through the year and he goes, what kind of money you want? Well, I'm doing TV, right? So I'm making money on TV. And I said, look, you just give me 60% of the points fund money at the end of the year, right? He says, you sure? I said, I got my TV money from, you know, the TV show. We get to Indianapolis Raceway Park. And he says, uh, I can't pay you. We're in debt. Uh, so you're driving free. So there's a story for you. Uh, I've had race teams say, Hey, you want your money, you know, here in December, you want your money now, but you're going to have to, you know, you know, it's your tax money. Or do you want to wait till the next year? I said, Oh, I'll wait till the next year. <laughs> and that team filed bankruptcy. Yeah. AJ, I've, I've, I've lost about $600,000 in real money. So I relate with you. I relate with you, and, but this is what we do to make it, right? Yeah, I mean, it, that's that's why I tell people a lot. Like, it's the coolest job in the world sometimes, but it's also the most miserable. You don't, you're not guaranteed anything, right? Like, you, you just hope that you get with a a race team that you know is solid and and trustworthy and things like that. But uh, it is a difficult sport. We all know some of the best drivers in the world have never made it because of money. And it's unlike any other profession because, you know, I feel like even growing up high school and college, like if you're, if you're a five-star and you're a stud more often than not, you're going to get noticed and you're going to have an opportunity in this sport. Some of the most five-star rated people that drive race cars never got an opportunity or, or a real good one at least. So, I mean, you just got to be at the right place, right time. You got to have uh, opportunities. You got to succeed in those opportunities, but yeah, it's it's a challenging sport. It's it's fulfilling on days like at the Roval, and other days it is like gut wrenching, like it is the worst thing in the world. Even though we know it's not, we're just driving race cars, but uh, it it can feel like that. As old Bill Elliott say, he say Herman, it's all about timing and circumstances. So right now, 
Let, let's uh, let's start Kenny conversation now. Uh, man, let's go back to the win two weeks ago. Uh, what they call this bad boy? They call it the 2023 Bank of America. You were the winner at Charlotte the Roval. Uh, we talked about it. It's a real road course now. There's a little bit of elevation in it. Um, you know, you are incredibly good on ovals and road course. But, you know, once you took the lead, and um, let's go to the end and then we'll go forward. When you were in victory lane, you were incredibly emotional. And, and you've won a lot of races. And we're going to get to those in a minute. I'm going to read you your stats. Why were you so more emotional for this win than I think any of your other wins? Well, I mean, it's a cup win. First of all, you, it's so hard to get an opportunity to, to win a cup race, uh, you know, especially where we're at as an organization. We're trying to grow. You're trying to get better. Uh, but you're racing against all, all the big dogs. And, and there's those those opportunities at times feel very far and, and few in between. So, you know, a couple of times this year, we, we, we've been close. Last year, I felt like at the Roval, we had a great shot to win it, but it's just hard to, to win a cup race. So, you know, as the year has progressed, it hasn't went like we'd hoped. It's, 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 it's a second year cup team, right? So you have the ups and downs. There's weekends you think, oh yeah, we're, we're on this now. Now here it comes. And then all of a sudden you just have weeks where uh, it just all falls apart and you feel like you can't get out of your own ditch. So I put a lot of that on my shoulders. I put, you know, really all of it on my shoulders. I feel like I'm always trying to raise our game, bring us to the next level. Uh, I give everything I have. And, you know, it's it's those really close family and friends and, and really close team members that that see that emotion at times where you just you're just hard on yourself and you feel like, man, I'm letting everybody down. So I think that's where that emotion comes from is you cross that line and it just floods out like all that, all that, that emotion that, you know, sitting at home at times, maybe in tears. Cause I'm down like, man, I'm letting everybody down those frustrations sitting on the plane after a race and, and being mad at yourself and, you know, looking at everybody and, and, you know, whether you need to apologize or not, but you just, I do. It's like, man, I'm, I'm not helping us get better. We need to, I'm sorry. And that's, that's where that emotion comes from. So it, yeah, it's, you know, there was times during that race we'd be under yellow and I'd let my mind creep like, man, we if we win this race. It's going to be cool. But then it's like, OK, knock that off. Shut up. We, Stop we, talking yeah, to me. We, we got a long ways to go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's but that's how I've always been. Right. You've known me for, wow, almost 20 years now, Kenny. Yeah. Like, I mean, we raced against each other in 07. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Sometimes when I do Kenny conversation, uh, I'm a little jaded, meaning that I know too much uh, and I can get distracted when I'm doing these conversations. I totally understand what you're saying. So what you're saying is you have things we we have things bottled up inside of us. And when we win the race, we don't realize it. And we just like, Jesus, why am I crying? You know, oh, I get it. I wanted it so bad that I suppressed it inside me. So with that being said, uh, Al Unser Jr., he would say, and, and I've used this technique, uh, he would say before he started the Indianapolis 500, he had a song of the day before every race. And it sounded kind of silly, but it made sense for me. And, you know, he said his song one year for the Indy 500 was Mustang Sally. And he, so... Do you have any quirks? Do you have any techniques when your mind gets ready to wander? Uh, do you have a song of the day? Do you do anything? Do you talk? You know, I mean, I do. I'm like focus, talk, you know. What do you do in that car to stay extremely focused when your mind wants to look in the grandstands? Uh, I mean, I don't have any weird quirks about it. I think the only thing that every now and then, uh, I just have Seinfeld episodes. Run through my head. <laughs> Perfect. Cause it's Perfect. like, I watch so much Seinfeld, like, and I've watched every, every episode about a hundred yeah. times. So it's like every now and then you just get a, you just get a Seinfeld episode under caution that starts flowing through your head and, and you're just riding around and reset your brain. Yeah. I'll never forget. I was, I want a, a an Xfinity race at Martinsville 
and the caution's out. And I look inside, you know, in the pit area, and there, there's my probably five, six-year-old daughter. She's doing headstands. And I'm thinking, and I'm leading the race under caution. And I'm like, why is my daughter doing heads? Focus on the race, Kenny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like squirrel. You're like, oh, okay. Look at that <laughs> yeah, well, so in this race, um, a lot of pit strategy. And you have to nail it in certain areas of the racetrack. To you, what area of the racetrack do you think you killed them? You you were able to keep the lead. You were able to be consistent. And, and also on the other side, what corners every time you came upon you and all know? What was your best? What was your worst? So I felt like our weakness, uh, we had a little bit in practice. And, and you know, I kind of, it, it's it's kind of what we fight uh, sometimes is is rear drive, rear grip as, as the run goes on. Uh, I knew, and, and we talked about it that, that Sunday morning, that, you know, we had a lot of speed in the race car. I was upset with qualifying because I messed up the, the second round. I actually thought we had a real good shot to qualify pole. Uh, we were the fastest in our group. I think the fastest overall at that point through the first two groups. And I just, I messed the lap up. So I knew we were, we had the speed and not being in the playoffs was actually a benefit for us because with the with the stage breaks back, I knew we were always going to short pit the stage. We weren't going to have to worry about points. So uh, more often than not, we we're going to keep our track position as long as we, you know, executed. Uh, so once I got to the lead and, and in general, the infield of the racetrack, basically from turn two to turn eight, which is the, the mm. hard left-hander back onto the NASCAR banking, my car was crazy good and really fast. So that's where I was making a lot of my passes was that double left getting on to, to the NASCAR oval. Uh, but with that said, I knew also where the tires were being hurt was getting onto the, the NASCAR oval. And then because of that, that would cause the rear brakes to start trying to lock up at the end of the back straightaway. So there at the end of the race, when William got behind me, uh, I knew he was going to be strong. He'd been kind of just laying in the weeds a little bit, fourth, fifth, sixth. So we know how fast those, those Hendrick cars are. Uh, so I, I basically knew that getting on to the NASCAR banking was my critical area. He wasn't going to touch me in the infield. Yeah. Uh, and there was like seven to go. I tried to overdo it just a little bit and I got loose getting on the banking. That's he made the one run on me down the back straightaway where I had to defend. And I knew I was a little bit weak. It wasn't terrible into the break zone, but he was just a little bit better. Uh, so from there on, that was it. Just get onto the banking clean, get like that four or five car length, lead to where he couldn't get me into the break zone and then we were actually really good out of the chicane and i'd stretch that back out so those were always the areas i knew especially leading the race there at the end of what i had to focus on you know as as i'm running the race with you i'm following you in your mind right now uh now i know there's elevation uh at the roval it is is the roval like a mini daytona a little bit I mean, it seems like somewhat the same turns. And, you know, when you when you compare the, the course itself, uh, what what do you think? Uh, I mean, it seems like the same. Yeah, Daytona is just really flat, though. So yeah, in the that's infield, what I mean. Yeah, yeah so in Daytona, the, it, there's, there's no elevation change at all. It is just flat corners. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the infield, which is – it's you wouldn't really think it, but actually in the infield – there at the Roval, there's way more grip than on the banking. Yeah. So that was, but you know, that's, that's part of it is just, you know, it's, it's driving a race car in general, but that's, it's more road course racing where you got to find the weaknesses and strengths of the race car mm -hmm. and then how they correlate to where that makes you fast on the racetrack. And that sounds pretty simple, but you know, at the end of the day, like I said, it's, it's okay. They're, if I just get three or four car lengths, even though I'm weak into the break zone, they're not going to pass me as long as I don't right. make a mistake. And right. that's what you're just trying to piece it together the whole race. Like, okay, where am I strong? Where am I weak? If I'm behind the car, where can I pass a guy? And where can I just need to chill and know not burn the tires up? Uh, and that's, and it's, it's like a, it's a, like a chess match in my head the whole time of piecing that all together. And, uh, and if you get the opportunity of lead, leading the race, then you put, everything together and, and that's how you try to make your moves and and you know in my case really defend and so here you are you know these things and these kids that are listening to you right now 
learned a lot. If I can gain here, all they can do is get to my bumper here. So, all right, this is something we do. I'm going to tell you how great you are. And then, <laughs> and, and when my stats are wrong, you interrupt. And then at the end, we're going to, we want you to tell me what you think. And I do this with every driver. Okay. Uh, something I dreamed up. So, Four, now, it's going to take a long time because out of every driver I've ever had on Kenny Conversation, and I mean this, you are the most incredibly well-rounded driver. You beat them all. You beat Tony Stewart. You beat Mark Martin, all of them. And when I'm done, I'm going to be exhausted. Listen to these stats. 407 NASCAR races over 15 years. Three cup wins. 17 wins in the Xfinity Series. 2021, 2022 Xfinity regular season champion. Here's where we have fun. Two-time International Karting Federation champion, champion. 2002 Barber Dodge Pro Series champion. 2003 Champ Car Atlantic champion. 2004 Champ Car Rookie of the Year. Now let's go back to NASCAR. 2008. 2014, 2018, Monster Energy Open winner. That's before the All-Star race. This one here is incredible. 2012, Daytona Rolex 24 winner. Holy moly. Where's the watch at? Uh, it, it's it's in a safe place. And then when I'm feeling, <laughs> when I'm feeling a little down on myself and I, yep. and I need that little pep talk, I just put that watch on and I'm like, okay, I, I feel good. 2014 winner at the Glen, 2021 winner at the Brickyard. We're almost done. This one's pretty cool here. This is what I'm talking about, well-rounded. Five wins in champ car. For a lot of you people don't know, that's IndyCar. That's Indianapolis 500 type cars. First uh, win was at Portland, Oregon. And the teams you drove for, uh, Team Red Bull, Richard Petty, Penske, Phoenix Racing, JTD Dartery. So I'm going to take my glasses off. When I say all that, what does your, your mind do? Tell me about all that. I mean, first of all, it, it makes me feel very fortunate that I've had a lot of opportunities. You know, I always have said I earned them because when I had to go win races and get to the next level, that's what I did. But I also happen to be at the right place at the right time, just for so many reasons. You know, it started with racing go-karts. My, my mom was a, a medical nurse. My dad's a carpet layer. You know, it was always in the off-season, do you want rubber for your feet or rubber for your go-kart? Wait a minute. You have Your family has no racing background? My dad raced local local stuff. But, yeah. The, the only, hard. The, they mortgaged their house three times to make sure that I kept racing. You did so, good. So, um, and for everybody listening, I I, I paid that back. I, I, paid, <laughs> I paid all three mortgages. What is it with this now? I didn't have daddy's money. Yeah, don't, don't treat me like, did you ever pay him back? Yeah, I, I paid off all the mortgages, so <laughs> we're good. Um, but, you know, it started with Paul Tracy, like, you know, the, the IndyCar star. Like, when I was in karting, I my parents didn't, we didn't have any money to go test race cars or anything like that, so... He signed me up on his go-kart team, and just by his association, my name started getting out. And then I got an opportunity at Skip Barber, and, and Skip Barber himself uh, loved me and gave me, you know, on the back door, some free races that I wasn't going to be able to, to pay for. Uh, and, and there was people inside of Skip Barber that I shall remain nameless just, just in case. Gave him a uh, bottle yeah. of bourbon free. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they gave me a couple of things here and there and stuff like that, and you know, maybe some crash damage bills swept it under the uh, the table, uh, and then you know, so that was the whole Barber Dodge stuff, and then Carl Russo for Toyota Atlantics and my initial start into Champ Car, and you know, I won all the races with Jerry Forsythe. The the great story about that was, uh, you know, me and Carl parted ways. He thought the team needed to go a different way, and I I hadn't won a, a Champ Car race for them. And Jerry Forsyth signed me, and I won the next three. So, <laughs> so that, 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 that's what Bill Elliott says, timing and circumstance. Yeah, so, and then just, it all goes to that. And then, you know, the, the two series were split, and I had to deal the sponsor, uh, personal sponsorship with Red Bull. And, 
that got me in into NASCAR. And then for some reason, as I got let go, Richard Petty really liked me. Roger Penske's given me opportunities uh, the first time. And then when I needed it again, the second time, you yeah. know, guys like James Finch that allowed me back in the sport uh, and drive their cars. And then, you know, Tad and Jody and, and Brad uh, when I was driving the 47. And then, you know, when I thought I was done, next thing you know, this guy, Matt Collig and Chris Rice, they, they call me and, I've heard of Collard Racing, watched him in Xfinity, but never really talked to anybody. And now we're here. So I it just all of that just allows me to be thankful for the opportunities that I've gotten because I've earned them. But a lot of people have earned things and and you know not had those opportunities. So I'm I'm so thankful for all the opportunities and been very fortunate that I've gotten to drive a lot of cool cars and I've won some events in in all kinds of different types of race cars. Why, you know, for, from the outside looking in for all of us, uh, for us racers, for media members, fans, it looks like Collig Racing, C. Rice, Matt, Matt Collig, it, it looks like, and I know not, but it almost looks like the team was built for you. It seems like you're the, the matriarch. It seems like, uh, uh, or, or was I supposed to say patriarch or matriarch? What is it? I think matriarch. I don't know. I hit a lot. It's like the grand poopa. I've 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 hit a lot of races <laughs> like you, man. I don't know. As a, as my brother Rusty <laughs> says, her sometimes you say some important words. <laughs> yeah. But it, I, it, hey, it, hey, th do this, Adam Alexander. When I first started, you know, doing TV stuff on on Race Hub, Adam Alexander, he would just, I mean, rattle stuff. All, I remember the the teleprompter broke one time, and he and just, you did a lot of TV. Yeah, and I I remember we went to commercial one time and this is like one of the first, like four or five times on the show. And I just looked at him and said, how do you do this? I'm like, like, you just, I know this is what you've trained for, but like any, he, he, this line will always stand up to me. He said, AJ, if you're on TV, especially, but this just goes in life. If you say it with conviction, they believe you. Yeah. Oh, well, I said it with conviction. Yeah. So matriarch, it's it. That's it then. Yeah. You, you, it seems like the team was made for you. Why are you such a good fit? at Colic. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, a big part of it is because I am older and, and just meaning that, you know, I showed up and had no expectations, right? I mean, I showed up in 19, just doing road course races and running some of the speedway races for them. And, and that was the plan in 20. And then with, uh, what was happening on with the map. The, yeah. With was what was happening in the pandemic. We just started doing more races and I happened to win Atlanta and, you know, win the dash for cash and Xfinity. And, and we started doing more races and found myself really when I wasn't racing, missing being at the racetrack with them. So, you know, the, the sport, especially in the Xfinity series and trucks and stuff like that, it's built on, you know, younger drivers coming up through the ranks and, and trying to make their names for themselves. And, you know, guys like, Justin Haley and, and Ross, when I was teamed up with them, I think it allowed me to, you know, be more open in the sense of like just being a good teammate and like not just focused on me trying to win, but focused on man, if they win, like we still all win. And, you know, to be brutally, brutally honest, you know, in my twenties, I definitely wouldn't have been like that. You bought so, into that. Yeah. So I think, and then because of that, I think they've bought into me being, you know, not just one of the drivers, it's, it's being a huge part of the team. So we talk all the time about things like that. So, I mean, I don't know. It's as cliches. It sounds, you know, maybe it's a match made in heaven. And uh, you know, I feel like, you know, as you said, maybe I put them on the map, but if they didn't give me this opportunity, like I wouldn't have won all these races. Like think about it this way, Kenny, like when I thought I was retiring and in, in at the end of 2018 and started working for NBC, I had won three races in NASCAR. I had won two Xfinity races for Team Penske and one Cup race. Yeah, you know. Now you just now you, now you just said it. Like I have twenty wins in NASCAR, and yeah. so seventeen of them are with Collard Racing. So we've done we've done a lot of amazing things in in really a short amount of time. I mean, nineteen and twenty were you know total. I think we did twenty one races in that time. So it's really been you know twenty one races plus three full seasons, and we have seventeen wins together. So I mean that's. We've done it together, which has been pretty special. The reason uh, Kenny Conversation brings that up with every driver is I find 
that for the people that are listening, and we're in podcast form too. Some of my friends tell me they listen going down the road. Is AJ, it, it's an old saying that big brother Rusty taught me. He said, Herm, and he means it with conviction. He says, it's sad to say, but you have to remind people because people remember what they want to. Uh, you can win everything. And five years later, you know, they just forget and they move on to the next thing. But AJ Allmendinger is incredible. You've done a lot. Uh, the next thing I want to bring up is something that really, really uh, caught me off guard, which I kind of knew, but I didn't know the numbers. Listen to this one. The last 15 of the 17 years you have drove for Michael Shank Racing in the Daytona 24. Something, something is, is really cool about you. What I've learned is that NASCAR, the Cup Series, roughs us all up. We get spit up, spit out. But it seems like with Colleg Racing with, and with Michael Shank, you've raced 15 of the last 17 years, and you won that Daytona 24 in 2012. So my question is this. Why Michael Shank? What is the deal with you and Michael Shank? Man, Michael Shank is, is you know, one of the best people I've ever met in my life. I mean, he's, That's what he's I love. <laughs> he, he he is like a big brother to me. Um, he's absolutely amazing. It it started with when when I was at my first champ car team, uh, the the driver coach Barry Waddell and and Michael and and then the team president Jeremy D Dale. They they kind of knew each other, and Michael had just asked him like, "Hey, like any chance that AJ and Justin Wilson want to drive for me at Rolex next year?" You know, that'd be great. So we did that and and I developed a relationship with Mike. And, you know, basically from 2006 to 2000, I think it was 18 or 17 uh, or maybe 2019. Like I drove in every race with him, you know, every Daytona with him. And that was, I mean, we have, and this is awesome. Now he has three wins in the Daytona Rolex. You know, they won the last two, uh, but I mean, there was a time I, I, we were so close every year. And I remember it was 2011. He told me at one point, he's like, we lead in the race and we blow up again. And it's like, he, he sat down next to me at the hauler and said, man, you deserve to win this race. Like if, you know, Chip or, or, you know, one of those, you know, Wayne Taylor, one of those guys asked you, man, go do it. Mm, I, he likes I, you. I, I told Mike, I said, F off, Mike. I'm like, man, <laughs> I was like, we're, we're, I'm like, we're, we're doing this. To, we're never doing this together or we're doing this together. I'm like, but no matter what it's together. I'm like, I'm like this, this place owes us. Like we are going to win this damn thing, whether it kills us trying. So, and that's, there, there was times like, you know, when I got suspended and, you know, he put me in the race car, paid me to be in his race car and put me in it. There was times when, he came to me and said, man, I, I, I'm broke. I don't have any money to pay you. You know, I'd still love you to run Rolex, but he's like, honestly, I can't pay you. I mm -hmm. said, I don't care, man. I'm not, I'm not racing this race to, for the money. I'm like, I've raced that race because a it's the Rolex 24. It's one of the most pre prestigious sports car races in the world. I'm like, but for the pure reason, and this reason why I haven't done it really since is I'm like, I, I just, do this race to race for you. Oh. Like, that's it. Like, I, I love, I you love him. Mike Shank, whether his, his business business was booming in racing or whether he couldn't pay anybody, he kept all the same. Every person from like 06 that I met was on the team still in like 2019 for the most part. I mean, I think it was like 85%, 90% of the people had been the same people because he always took care of his people. So that race was just, I love doing it with that whole group. And, and it's part of the reason why now, you know, when he couldn't put me in the car because Honda had their drivers in, I didn't even look for other team. Cause I'm like, man, it's just, it, it doesn't make it any fun. And it's, a, it's the same thing now with, with Matt and Chris. It's like, I don't really want to go drive for another team because it, you know, we do this partly, although it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes we do this for fun. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go do that with anybody else. So, um, when Kim and myself got married, she's a Catholic, I'm a Lutheran, and we went to pre-Cana class. It, it, it means where you go see if you're compatible. And uh, Father John, he said to me, Kenny, and I've told this story a lot, 
uh, but not so much that I've wore it out. Father John says, so Kenny, what are, what are you going to do, young man? I said, so happily, I said, I'm going to be a race car driver. And Father John said, oh, he was very serious. He said, be careful. Competition will kill you. I knew what he meant. So we say it the same. You know, this is a sport. This is fun. But but it's not fun. It, it tears your damn heart out. It's yeah. miserable. And do you, so my question is this. Do you think competition in NASCAR it requires a sense of misery. You almost got to be miserable. I mean, I don't know anybody that's happy and winning. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I, it, I, I always say I have the best life in the world. Like if you, if you would have asked 16 year old AJ, like, Hey, by the way, at 41, you're still going to be, paid to drive race cars daniel hemrick actually brought this up to me last year i and and since daniel's become a part of college racing he's one of my best friends i love him his family kenzie uh you Good know family man yeah like i i just i love daniel hemrick yeah and i remember he and, and he's a grinder right like he's a guy that builds his own race car i don't know how to build my own race car that's the one yeah. thing if i could go back and redo it i would love to have learned how to you, do that you didn't grow up in a, a, a mechanically inclined family so that's that's yeah. all good neither did jeff gordon so yeah. i did yeah. but you know that's it, it's all good though yeah but so but you know daniel's a grinder i remember he he brought this up to me last year we were sitting on a plane somewhere and he goes so wait how long have you been paid to drive race cars? And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, how long have you been getting a, a paycheck? And that's your form of, of money. <laughs> like, and I just go, I don't know, 2002. And he's like, you've been paid every year since 2002 to drive race cars. I said, yeah. He's like, that's amazing. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> and I, like it, it, it got to the point where like, at first I've never, I didn't think about it. I was like, yeah, that's what I've done my whole life. But I've been fortunate enough every year I've raced cars and I've been paid, you know, some years better than others, but I've been paid and that's all I've ever done for a living. So it's, I always tell people I have the best life in the world. And it's also why I'm miserable every day because <laughs> I wake up and it's like, yesterday wasn't good enough. Go be better. It's why I go practice golf every day and I'm miserable every day doing it. And I yeah, wake up a miserable sport. It's terrible. <laughs> The ball just freaking sits there, and you just just trying to hit it into this tiny asshole. Like out of all the slam they use, yeah, and, you know, and it's but it's the same deal. I'm like cussing. I want to snap clubs. I'm like I'm done. I hate this sport. You know, that's six o'clock last night, six in the morning. I'm up. Like, well, better go to the range and get better. You can't get it. You know, you're not going to get any better sitting here. And that's so you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's sense of misery is required. Yeah. You know the. Kyle Larson wins 10 races, but you know, those, those 26 he'd lost, he was probably a miserable human being at home. So like, that's how we are. You know, I started racing with Jeff Gordon and uh, he he's so good, right? He's one of the greatest drivers oh, yeah. of all time across the board. And I was fortunate to be friends with him. And what I learned about Jeff and you brought up Kyle is that when drivers are that great, they don't know it. When I talk to Brad Sweet, you know, Brad Sweet and Kyle, you know, they're brother-in-laws and they own high limit racing together. Brad Sweat, Brad, Brad Sweet says Kyle just doesn't realize how good he is. It th that is a uh, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? I mean it really so you speaking on the Kyle Larson thing, right? He yeah. he drove <laughs> one of our college race and Chevy's at Darlington this year, and you know wax the field basically like started yeah. started from the back like four times like with yeah. speed down oh, pit road car. yeah <laughs> speed down pit road like you know and, and drive back through the field and uh i give him hell for it now yeah because chris is like yeah our darlington package is pretty good i'm like yeah kyle kyle larson rips the fence i'm like for us mortals at like yeah you know like so that you know yeah and kyle i, I so i give kyle crap all the time i see him i'm like I'm like, I'm going to need you to teach me how to run the fence in the Xfinity car. Cause I'm like, like, I don't know how to like, you're like, like you do. And he's like, and he's like, ah, it takes a good car. I'm like, bro, like, <laughs> oh, like they try to make you feel better. Well, and that's why, it's, you know, people brought what up the, Indy, yeah, people brought up the Indy 500 and they're like, what are your, what's your expectations? You know, of what would be 
a good day for Kyle next year when he runs any 500. I said, winning. Yeah. Because right. that's how that's Seriously. how good he is. I expect him to win. Yeah. Well, we only see drivers like that come along every 20 years. I mean, we saw Jeff Gordon, uh, you know, and during Jeff Gordon, you're young, but during Jeff Gordon's era, along came this Tiger Woods. Yeah. We have this phenomenon going on where these kids are racing at five years old out at Millbridge, the dirt track, and all you see is this helmet bopping around in the car. So my excuse is, hey, man, I started racing like 18. They're starting them at, it, when they come out of their mama's womb now. So. Yeah, I, did. I I never sat in a race car, like a, a legit race car until I was 18. Yeah, right. And like well. now, now you see these guys, like like you said, I mean, hell, late model, when a late model race is like 12 years old. I'm like, I'm like, I couldn't, I was like, I can't imagine at 12 strapping into an 800, 900 horsepower dirt late model in like, I was at South Boston, you know, a couple weeks ago, you and I talked about it. And I looked at this little baby boy. I looked at him. I said, it was driver's introduction. And I said, how old are you? He said, 12. <laughs> I said, am I racing you? He goes, no, I'm in the bigger class. <laughs> I did a little video. I said, what is going on? How, how does a 12 year old child that's not even totally developed run any, I think he drove, the black number six in the pro late models, but yeah, I mean, you're right. So, all right, we, we got a, my God, we were already at 41 minutes. We're going to come to the end here. And I do this with everybody, AJ, let's start wrapping it up. Um, and I always tell everybody, don't get yourself in trouble when I ask you these questions, but this is what the fans want to know. What is your opinion on NASCAR today? How, how they're doing today? Uh, I, so in, in one sense, I think it's really good because, you know, and you probably could even speak on this. I, I felt like the scheduling for a long time was the most monotonous, boring schedule of all time. Yeah. You go to the same racetracks twice in like 10 weeks. Um, ha, you know, all the racetracks almost felt the same and it just got boring and it got stagnant. You could see on everybody's face during, during the season. Like, so I, I love what they're doing now schedule wise. Um, I think there's a lot. Of, I mean, the talent that's in there right now is is some of the best. I mean, whether it's, you know, guys like Martin and Denny and, and you know, obviously Kevin's retiring, but he still runs up front. Or you got, you know, young guys that are in there like William and uh, Kyle and, and you know, just the, the young talent that we have. I mean, I think the sport, the future of the sport, Ty Gibbs right now, the, the, the yeah. future of that sport when it comes to uh, – just talent wise is huge. Now I'm not going to get why well, I think they should have a little bit more personality sometimes, you know, but the, but the sponsors get but mad. The spon at but don't, you can't blame the drivers all the time for that. Some of them are like that. And some of them have personality, but they're not allowed to show it. Um, you know, this new car, I don't mind driving the new car. I think there's good and bad with it. Okay. Uh, stop right there. That is, that is my next question. What's your opinion on the next gen car. Yeah. I, so it's, I, I actually enjoy driving it. Um, but, you know, I think there's things like, I, I we all wish there was more horsepower in the car. You know, being at these mile and a half racetracks, which the funny thing is the mile and a half races have actually been some of the best races in, in the last probably 10 years of, of mile and a half racing. But you just don't have a lot of off throttle time. You know, I think Martinsville is the same way. Like you downshift. And you throttle right back up, and it doesn't spin the tires, so mm -hmm. it makes the short track racing not very good. And it's been the same problem with the road course stuff. Like you just kind of mat the throttle off the corner, and uh, so. But I don't think they're going to change the horsepower. So you know that's that's something that we got to work around. And and but you know what I do enjoy about it is it's not like NASCAR is just sitting on their hand, you know, their their hands and going, ah, racing's fine. I don't know what you're talking about. They're trying stuff with the car. Yeah. Whether whether your opinion about the car is good or bad, at least you keep trying stuff. And that's all you can ask for. Right. I agree. All right. So this one is a little controversial because it just happened over the last two days. What is your opinion on the way NASCAR is officiating technical inspection, uh, fines, uh, record setting fines earlier this year with Hendrick? Uh, what do you think of all this officiating? 
Well, I, I do think that, you know, when it comes to if your car is illegal, it's illegal. Now, you know, the, the problem is, is some of the parts like because we had this the, the problem with the 31 car the movers. Yeah, it yeah. was. But we had bought them like we didn't yeah. touch them. Like that's how they came. And then you get penalized for it. And then, it, you know, luckily it got rescinded to a certain degree. You still got Matt Collig still got fined for it. But the points at least weren't were, were given back. But um, it, the officiating, the, if your car's illegal, I like that they, you know, if they know that you're cheating on something, you should get penalized heavy for it. But sometimes, you know, the, the gray areas of, of whether it was just a bad manufactured part or things like that, you know, it's, it's tough. So, but at the end of the day, it's the same for all of us. So, you know, for the teams, you just got to figure it out. But I, I do like that if, if, they know you were cheating. You should yeah. be heavily penalized for that. Yeah, they get hammered. As we yeah. saw earlier in the year, uh, Rick Hendrick, or was that last year? 400,000. No, that was this out. year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a lot. Well, AJ Almendinger, look at you, buddy. I reminded everybody how great you are. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on Kenny Conversation. And for everybody, I remind you about this time every time. Remember, we're in podcast form. And I really enjoy everybody saying they're listening to us in podcast form. We're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. AJ, thank you so much. Well, I'm glad, Kenny, that you held this to 45 minutes because between you and me talking, we probably could go like seven hours and not even know it. So hey, I appreciate it. Well, I have a little timer up here, and I and I know. So listen, AJ, uh, do good. Only three races left. Miami Homestead and, uh, of course, Martinsville and Phoenix. So until next time, everybody, until the next Kenny Conversation.